Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, and we're here for the Invincible Season 2 finale. I'm your host Paul, and I can't wait to talk about the episode, because there's lots of callbacks and things for the future. As always, we're going to be bringing you a scene-by-scene breakdown, and also discussing the issues and moments that inspired them. So come with us as we travel through the multiverse and bring everything you need to know about the finale. We also spoke to co-showrunner Simon Rassiopa, and there's lots of insights and things that he answered. So smash that thumbs up, hit that subscribe, and join us as we venture into... Now we start off on the Veltromite ship and watch Nolan tearing apart their forces. Normally after they've subjugated a planet, they force the inhabitants right under their rule. This is why we get aliens and robots at this point, and it shows Nolan's back up to speed with how he once was. We watch him basked in a red light, and this echoes a time that he was in the Flaxen's dimension. It really shows just how destructive he is, and perfectly riffs off a moment from issue 46. That scene him going against the exact same forces, and the show perfectly recaptures what was done there. And we learn that this is all just a test, to make sure Nolan's at his best. But I'm not a rapper. You see, in Voltramite culture, it's thought that the soldiers of their army should be at least given a death when they're at their peak. They're all about besting the best of the best of the best, sir, so this is thrown at Nolan to make sure he's back. Now back on Earth we see a jogger, who then takes us in the final title card. That cracks away, just leaving the bloom black, which in itself has a deeper meaning in the show. A bloom black suits the second costume that Mark gets, and it's sort of ushered in a big change in the character. The bloom black one didn't f about, and he ended up debating over whether to kill people or not. This is because of, well, prime examples like this week, where villains are going to take his family hostage. Last week he saw Amber in danger too, and thus he needs to look at things a little differently. I was actually surprised the black and blue suit didn't debut in the season, purely because of these title cards, but obviously they are going to be saving that for next time. Either way, we lead into a story from issue 33, which sees Mark and Levy facing off against each other. Inside the house, Mark finds Levy holding Debbie and Oliver, which is a moment ripped right out of the comics. Levy brings up how he knows Mark's identity because, in other realities, he's already been exposed. Mark then says, Oh God, you're that guy. With this bit of dialogue and the part that follows it pulling directly from the book. Diving at him, he's then sent into the multiverse, which has been perfectly recreated from the comics. But the worlds he travels into are also them too, with the first of these being the dinosaur reality. In that world, sapiens were extinct because we'd coexisted alongside dinosaurs. We didn't develop the ability to communicate, whereas they did, and due to their size, they dominated our species. Sort of like a Planet of the Apes thing, but with dinosaurs, and it sort of sent us into an extinction, and thus they became the dominant life form. Now in both the book and show, Mark's pulled back into the living room, which is where he catches Levy. You know, I haven't encountered him in any other reality yet. Isn't that interesting? Now this too could be a difference like Debbie, who we think's the reason Mark didn't turn evil. As we know, some visions join with his father, but in this world, he had a strong moral compass. Personally, I believe that's purely down to Debbie, who nearly raised him on her own due to Nolan being absent. We learn about how Debbie joined Nolan and Mark in other realities, and I think she's actually this universe's key component. That line about Oliver highlights that as well, and I'm guessing that every other Debbie may have refused to raise him. Either that or he wasn't born because Nolan didn't have to leave and go and start a new life on Thraxa. Therefore, Oliver wasn't born, he didn't get given to Debbie, and it's lots of timey wimey multiversal stuff that changes the whole dynamics. Either way, that line about him not being there in other realities is something that also pulls directly from the comics. Now, it's at this point that Mark's sent into another universe in which we meet, let's call a guy Arachnikid. He swings on web lines, sticks on walls, and has web patterns on his costume, but we can categorically say that that's not Spider-Man. That's due to legal issues, mate. And when we did our predictions for Season 2, we did say that this could be a certain webhead. And that's because of what happened in the comics, with Mark also travelling into this world as well. There he bumped into, let's say, Dr. Squid, and we could see a web wedded hand right near the portal. Upon exiting it, we also saw a web strand behind Mark, which is recreated in the show as well. The character mentions that he understands Mark's from another universe, as he has dealt with that a lot recently himself. This is of course a nod to the Spider-Verse without dealing in multiversal elements. He also calls the villain Lieutenant Worms, without of course being a play on Dr. Octopus. Mark apologises for knocking Worms over, and then says he thought that Arachnikid was the villain. Now, Originally, when Stanley pitched Spider-Man, it was thought that people would think that he was the bad guy. That's because people associate spiders with being scary, but as we know, he's won everyone else's heart. Now in the comics, the hand and web line was as much as we got, with the scene being far more fleshed out here. 
However, we did also get a crossover entry down the line, which had the pair teaming up together. So you folks can see how I came to that conclusion with my Season 2 predictions video, but I'm guessing this was just all one big legal issue. Josh Keaton's behind the voice as well, and he played the character in The Spectacular Spider-Man. Now, what I loved about the finale uh, this season is when you get Mark going through to other realities, and obviously he interacts with a certain character voiced by Josh Keaton. There's also a man who dresses like a bat. Are there any other famous voice actors known for superhero characters that you'd like to get involved down the line going into other seasons? Oh my God. I mean, that, that list would be, we could be here all day, right? It'd be great. Yeah. I mean, like I would love like, you know, be great to, you know, I, I got to work with, you know, Anthony Starr when I did Diabolical for the boys. He's incredible. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many great actors, but I mean, like we, we, we're very lucky in our cast. Like we're actually yeah. already getting to work with lots of incredible actors. Mark Hamill. So, yeah. Mark, I mean, Mark Hamill, that was a dream come true for me. It's sort of like I grew up on watching him on star in star Wars and, you know, so getting to work on work with him and meet him and just see how amazing and lovely he was and gracious he was coming on the show. Like that was, that was a treat come true. Right. So yeah, we're very, very lucky with the cast on our show, and uh, I would love to add more people to it, and hopefully we will going forwards. Now, the nod to Batman there pulls directly from the comics too, with us getting a single panel of Mark talking with him. That was clearly a nod to the animated series verse, with the red sky of Gotham being taken directly from that. Now, upon returning, Levy says, I've got a dimension all picked out, where the ground is eight stories lower than it is here. In the comics, we learned this had been caused by a meteor hitting the planet, which had lowered the ground by six stories. We'll let you off for changing it from six to eight. Uh, we'll let you off there. I'm not going to nitpick it. Now, in the book, he just tries to rush at Levy. Raz here, yeah, he starts to try and reason with him. Mark reminds him of how he saved his life at the start of the season, which is something Angstrom's clearly now repressing. I think he's been trying to justify his hate, as that's the only thing that's been keeping him going. It adds an extra layer to the character, and we see as he remembers the scene from the episode. Angstrom refused to build his utopia with blood, and he was the one who in the end saved Mark. We also get a flashback to the episode with Evil Mark, which then spins off into his origin story. He goes to tell his son everything's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be okay. Which explains why he berated Debbie for saying it before. You're okay, Oliver. It's gonna be okay. There's no way to know that for sure. What kind of mother lies to her son like that? Now this point an evil Mark arrives who designed riffs off a version from the comics. No massive spoilers for what's coming, but these versions of Mark play a certain role down the line. Mark grabs his son's head, and this is a similar position to what Levy had Debbie in. It's also what Anissa did to Amber last week, and probably an MO for the Viltrumites. Unfortunately, Levy wasn't able to save him, so this is why he's exactly the same sort of torture with Debbie. A Jude Angstrom possessing all of the memories of himself across the multiverse, he's bombarded with flashbacks of who destroyed his life. In every reality we see, Mark's been a destructive force which we see playing out here. There's a version in a tracksuit who kinda looks like a one we encounter in the comics, and it's foreshadowing a threat coming down the line. These scenes though, they're just so messed up, and yeah, watching, watching a version of him walking along chopping people's heads off with his hand, it's pretty fun. Up. Now I know I keep talking about what the show does to elevate the characters, but scenes like this I absolutely love. Just gives insight to what we've never seen before, and highlights the nature that Invincible could bring. You can also see how you'd get so used to hating someone that, even if there was a good version, you just wouldn't see it. Now at this point he baits Mark with a dagger, which he uses to send him into the Walking Dead universe. That was teased to us earlier in the season, and was one of the worlds that Angstrom ended up walking through. This moment is pulled right out of the comics, with it being the next world that Angstrom sends Mark into. Robert Kirkman created The Walking Dead, and he was also the brains behind Invincible as well. Back with Debbie, she smashes Levy over the head with an ornament, which is also something that she did in the comics. Levy then says, Not very smart. Whereas in the comics, he said, Not very wise. Look, do you care about the nitpicking? You probably don't, but we're just trying to be thorough. Now Levy gets angry when she points out Mark's good in this reality, whereas Levy's the bad guy here. He ends up breaking her arm, which is also a move he resorts to in the book. All that stuff about Levy being the bad guy is added though, and it raises the idea that he's the one who's caused all his issues. Now we then get Mark in multiple realities, all of which pull directly from the books. There's the campfire scene, which we discover that he's been in for a long time. This was foreshadowed by Levy, who'd send him into a universe where time moved differently. He's then sent to a world run by Neanderthals, but I always thought it was like Viking troll dudes in the book. I'm, I'm bloody learning too. Anyway, this leads into Omnipodus, whose world he goes to next. 
Omnipotus showed up earlier in the season, with this being where he ended up right after that. And after Batman, we get the Mad Max world, with the comics just being a barren desert with cars and bodies. Helps to push the connectivity to other realms, and lastly Levy comes looking for him. Levy then pokes his head out a portal, which is a moment that pulls from the source material. And at this point Levy says, you Remember those doctors I told you about? The ones who rebuilt my body? Which is line for line pretty much what we got in the books. I also realised I need to leave stuff on screen for a little longer, but can you read that? You can read that? Yeah, yeah. So you might notice that. It says surgeons and doctors, those are the different things. Um, and we actually got a look at these in the comics, with them being mutant type figures that wore gas masks and had weird eye things. Levy then punches Mark through the multiverse, which is an awesome scene that pulls from the book. I always loved the way he was kind of punching out the panels, and along the way we see lots of other realities. Even can catch someone wearing a Burger Mart shirt, and all of these worlds are based off ones from the comics. Leads to a world that's a desolate wasteland, which I believe is the same location we saw at the start of the season. When Levy saved the Maulers from the prison, he actually ended up going to a world destroyed by nuclear war. Now we've never had it confirmed that these are one and the same, but I've always assumed that this is where it was. Either way, Mark ends up losing it, and he takes things to the next level with Levy. Smashing his face just like the like button, he then gets covered in blood, with this being one of the most unforgettable parts of the book. Just seeing him standing there almost completely red is something that really stuck with me. Here it's no different either, with him uttering, I thought you were stronger. And that cliffhanger was how we ended issue 34, but the show adds in a scene we didn't get. There we just picked up with Mark heading home, and he saw Debbie and Ollie being looked after in the Pentagon. Here we watch as Cecil's forces come across Debbie and Ollie, which is something that we didn't really ever get in the book. Levy mentioned earlier how he'd locked down communication on the house, and therefore there wouldn't be any surprises. Guessing that when they broke through the house, that this in the end is what allowed the signal to get through. You can also see across the street that the house is still smashed up, and this street mate, bit of a bit of a danger zone. Now from here we cut to Mark walking through the wasteland, which is a moment that started issue 35. Uttering, oh god, oh god, oh god, he realises that he's stuck there, which is punishment for what he did to Levy. Now from here we then cut back to Nolan, with Creed completely wailing on him. This comes from issue 47, along with the two Veltramites who are holding him down. One of these says that he looked up to the character, which is something another says to him in the comics. It's at this point that he passes by Alan, which is also a moment that pulls from the book. Because Alan's able to communicate telepathically, he's able to pass a message on to Nolan. Such a good moment in both the show and comic, and it lets you know the escape plans afoot. Now back in the wrecked world, Mark ends up coming across the same saviours that he does in the book. A green glow appears above his head, and from it comes the Guardians of the Future. Amongst them are two new characters we haven't encountered yet, and bulletproof Rexplode in the robot suit, Monster Girl and Eve. They come from a timeline in which Mark didn't return, and thus they've been frantically fighting for a way to get back to him. It's pulled right out of the box, with even the mysterious characters being exactly the same. The Hammer Guy is of course based on Thor, and there are some interesting dynamics here that change due to some major repercussions that come from Mark returning home. We never really get it explained why Rex posts this as robot, but in the show they cement a theory that I had. Three times it was a trick three time. He sounds exactly like uh, terrible, but he sounds exactly how robot does when he's posing as him. To me, this shows that he's not part of the lineup and that Rex poses him to not mess with Mark's head. They also talk about how they don't want to disrupt the time stream and thus making it seem like robot won't cause this to happen. Down the line there's going to be some major changes with the Guardians, and Eve hints that their timeline's not a good one. The Viltrumites probably launch an attack in the wake of Mark's absence, and you have the other factors in the story at play. They also hint that Mark remained here in this timeline, and that he became something else, which is probably a bad guy. So yeah, they're just trying to keep it all in play, without giving the game away. Like me mate, like me, I'm not trying to give it away, it's just a theory, it's just a theory. Now Eve doesn't mind telling Mark that she loved him, which is a moment taken right out of the books. It's really sad, and in this story this actually happened in a different order to how the shows handle it. The sequid assault happened way later than this, so when Mark and Eve hugged on the ship, it had a different meaning. That was after Mark was still grappling with the fact he knew that she liked him, and thus it had him realising he liked her too because of what they'd just been through. That talk with Art happened much later as well, and basically in it he talked about whether he should go with Amber or Eve. Heck, this is how different it is, mate. And sorry for saying heck there. Sorry for swearing. Um, when this happened, it was the moment where Robot got put in Rex's body, well, a clone one, so you can see how much stuff has been changed. That's why Robot being Rudy felt like such a bigger curveball, because we had no idea what was really going on with Robot. 
They had an awesome jump cut with it where we had the Rex reveal on one panel, and then right below it, Robot getting smashed by the Maulers. Robot is of course also a clone of Rex, so yeah, it was a nice way to foreshadow what was coming. And Mark returns back to find his home destroyed, and he arrives at the Pentagon just like in the books. We ended issue 34 with Mark and Debbie hugging, and the latter saying that she'd lived through worse. Just notice that both had the same black eye as well, and it highlights that Mark's bringing his dangers close to home. Heading to the roof, he clearly regrets killing, and Cecil tries to reassure him that he's not his father. Viltrumites all have tempers though, and this means things quickly turn to violence, which is something Anissa also brought up in the comics. Either way, it brings things full circle from the start of the season, as we had a Mark there who joined his father. This one's trying to avoid it, but he's starting to see just how difficult it is. Mark becomes a killer with Angstrom Levy, which I kind of felt reflected the opening of the season and the theme in which he's desperately trying not to become his father. We also have a new set of alternate worlds where we see evil Marks. When did you guys decide on that theme of where it would end? And if you can tell us, is there a theme and kind of certain things that you feel you're going to be taking things for season three? Sure. I mean, we sort of, we looked, we knew uh, very early on that we were going to end uh, season two around that point from the comic books, you know, maybe a little bit later, a little bit sooner. I, I sort of forget exactly where, but we knew that was going to be one of the big events in the last episode um, because it's a big event in Mart's life. I mean, you try, obviously you try to build a season around big dramatic events and you want to end with something really monumental that changes the character in some fundamental way. Uh, and I think we do that in the season. Um, you know, we end with Mark having killed someone kind of on purpose for the first time. Even if he thought Angstrom was strong, or even if he thought Angstrom could could take it, he still did it. And I can promise you that that's not going to go away in season three. Like those feelings, those emotions, the, that weight on Mark is going to be a big factor uh, going forwards with him. And he's he's never going to forget that. So yeah, we uh, that that's definitely a theme that we're going to explore and uh, go deeper into in season three. And I hope to see Powerplex. Powerplex is my number one. So no, is he guys, great? Please, yeah, I love Powerplex. I love that story with him. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, yeah, thanks, really thanks good. for your time. Uh, yeah. Paul, great to see oh, you again. Sure. Thanks for thanks you for uh, all the care about the show and all the writing for the show, and uh, we always appreciate that. Now at Guardians HQ, we see Rudy and have a little vulnerable moment where he confesses how difficult it's been adjusting to real life. Guy's been chronically online for most of his life, but he needs to start to see that she's not something to fix. He apologizes and they agree to another day, which is when we see some other love blossoming. That takes us to the start of issue 46, which is where we catch the immortal going to his cabin. Up in it's his original white costume that came from when he first started superheroing. This was a callback to the classic Superman costume with him being a hero that operated in the 30s. Next to it there's a golden cup which I believe might be from when he was a King Arthur's knight. Later on we get a better shot of the room and we can also see there's some swords in his shield. Might however be the holy grail but there wasn't really any mention of it in the comics. Next we also see Abraham Lincoln's hat from when the immortal was him. Now in the book Kay reveals that she's alive which is also what happens here. In the panel we can catch the hat, helmet and costume too along with the World War II uniform he had from when he fought in the conflict. Now normally when Kate's about you can see numbers on her chest and here we can see that there's just a zero. Turns out her brother Multiple told her to keep an original hidden away and then she could operate out of that. Now from here we could across to Egypt to build off the back of a scene that happened in season 1. That saw an archaeologist exploring a cave which we now get the other side of here. His daughter shows up rocking a scarab tattoo and with some help she manages to break into the cave. Clear allusions to the mummy and Moon Knight and I'm interested to see where they go with this. It's not something that they really did in the comics and I am wondering wh where it's going to go, if anywhere. Now across the sky we see Mark getting flashbacks of his time with his father in which his darker side came out. He's desperately trying to convince himself that he's not his dad and will do whatever he can to outrace his fate. It's a really deep moment and he goes to Amber but sees her on the ground and realises he can't be with her. It's symbolic of how distant they are and how their two lives just won't work together. However, Mark is able to rebuild, which we catch back at the house. A gas leak's been blamed again and though they're putting things back, I don't know if it's ever going to feel like a home again. Sure, it looks the same but something's missing and Debbie clearly misses the life she used to have. Mark's in that headspace too, with the pair then discussing their lives on the roof. Both rocking black eyes, this is a scene that appeared throughout the show with a pair talking it out. It's also where Nolan told his son about Viltrum and it's sort of, sort of like poetry they rhyme. 
Now, Mark tells his mother that he's dropping out of college, as at this point he's completely unable to balance his life. With great power comes great responsibility, and he now has to focus on being stronger and controlling his emotions. The Veltramite threat's always on the horizon, and he has to be as strong as he can for when that arrives. Going to Eve, the pair touch hands, but Mark ends up withdrawing, which I think is a much better way to handle their relationship. In the comics, Eve just showed up and was like, hey, I heard you're single now, so are we dating or what? Which completely negated the friendship she had with Amber. Yeah, though, it's developed much, much better, and it's clear that she's been what's missing in his life. But speaking of missing, we then cut across to Nolan in a scene that ends issue 45. Some slight differences here, because in the book, Alan hadn't arrived at the prison yet, and Nolan was there just talking to his cellmate. Here, though, Alan's telepathy allows him to reach out to Nolan, and the pair kind of discuss his feelings. Nolan goes through how he's feeling depressed, and he also says that he's no longer a Veltramite. Nolan also says, I think I miss my wife, which in itself is the last line in issue 45. It's a great way to close out the season, and it highlights a redemption of Nolan that I think is going to be a big thing for season 3, with there being lots of things that are coming down the line. Now, I want to address my predictions for that in its own separate video, but there's a lot of big things that are going to be happening in the show. Lots of little things that they're setting up here as well, but they did a great job of also giving this season its own arc. I think starting off the season with an evil Mark who followed his father was a brilliant way to foreshadow what we would be doing. Though there's been the villain fights and things in his way, the biggest battle Mark's had it is with himself. He's desperately trying to stop himself becoming a Veltramite and going down the dark path that his father wanted him to. It's what I think makes this season really sing, and I love there were so many improvements on the comics. The source material is something that I'm head over heels with, but I think they managed to improve it in almost every way. I think the extra character development they do with each of the leads also painted them in a new light that I hadn't seen before. It all works really well, and I love retreading this story with some extra things to help flesh it out. That, to me, is what an adaptation should do, and I think it was a great way to handle things. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed our breakdowns, and thank you for coming with me through the season every week. Obviously, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too, and make sure you subscribe to not miss our Season 3 predictions. Huge thank you again to Simon, of course, for stopping by the channel to also give us some insights on what's going on. Really appreciate you guys helping to push our videos out as well, and it just means opportunities like this, you know, we get to go and do them. So thank you for all the love, and if you've enjoyed it, please drop a like. If you also want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. For 99 cents a month, you'll get early access to videos every week, and it goes a massive way to helping us out the channel. If you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, we've also got our t-shirt line below the video that will let you pick up all of our tops, like our three time ones, to see your chump ones, whatever, House of Dragon, stuff and more. There's loads of designs on there all the time, I can't even keep up with them, so yeah, keep an eye out and thanks if you bought one. Now if you want something else right now, we've got a video on screen going over why Anissa is one of the most hated characters in all of the Invincible lore. Lots of messed up things, some spoilers in there too, and yeah, definitely head over there right after this. By the way, huge thank you for sticking through the video. I've been your host Paul, you've been the best, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace out.